so this week we're in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel is uh, one of those books where you're like, all right, uh, 12 chapters. It should be pretty smooth. We should be out of here in about 15 minutes. Uh, you know, but the thing is with Daniel is there's just so much in there. You know, it, There's so much in the book of Daniel. So while in the past we have covered books in one week that had like 48 chapters in, uh, we're actually going to break this down too into two sections because there's so much in there. Um, the book of Daniel, and so it's a very, very profound book. It's actually like the old, what Revelation is in the New Testament is kind of what Daniel is in the Old Testament, because there's so much in the book of Daniel. So let's kick it off as we usually do. Uh, Daniel, the author, of course, the prophet Daniel, he is identified as the author um, in Scripture. He is the one writing this. Uh, date of the writing, look at about 540 to 530 BC, that's about the period of time. And then again, why was this book written? What is going on? Well, the book of Daniel records the actions and prophecies and visions of the prophet Daniel. And what happened is, of course, you know, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar came in, conquered Judah, uh, led the exiles off, and Daniel is one of these people who was led off into exile. So he is um, led off into captivity, and now this is going to record uh, what is going on in the book of, of Daniel during this time. A quick side note, um, over the history, people, some like scholars or skeptics have wondered, was Daniel really the author of this book? Uh, and they, they, they posed some different theories that was written much, much later on, and they put things that were fulfilled as, as prophecy. Kind of like, okay, it happened, then we're going to write it as prophecy. And this, was, this was debunked many, many times, but the big debunk is when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found one of the early, early, earliest copies uh, of, of Daniel, earlier than anything ever um, recorded before. And so this, of course, shows this was written as it is said, when it was said, um, which is interesting, of course, because Daniel lays out many prophecies that were, we can see in history, have been fulfilled. Uh, just keep that in mind as we go through. Um, also, as you read the book of Daniel, you can kind of, it's really easy, actually. If you want to break it down into two sections, you can. Um, there's a first half and a second half. The first half of the book is mainly records a lot of what we all know is like the big events, you know, the history events, the things that happened to Daniel and things like that that go on. The second half of the book focuses a lot on prophecy, uh, things that is, uh, he's, is going to happen, he's prophesying is going to happen, some end times kind of stuff and things like that, which we'll get into, um, symbolism and things. But keep that in mind when you read it. Uh, it helps to read things. Uh, also, too, when we're in the book of Daniel, uh, we're going to kind of zoom into some big events, just kind of recapture the things that we already know, uh, maybe hit a few points in there, and then we'll move on because, again, there's no way of covering it all uh, that way. But there's so much in here. So uh, let's begin with just going through chapter 1. Chapter 1, this is Daniel's training in, in Babylon. So we'll pick it up here, Daniel chapter 1, uh, verse 1. It begins by saying this. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of the, his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Mishael, uh, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you are looking worse than other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. And so just keep, stop a second. 
and this is all going on. They're getting these young men, and they're getting them into this program, right? It's, it's, it's really the, the, the big indoctrination program. They're going to take these young men, strip them away of their heritage, their, their things they knew, uh, and reassign them everything. So the new names they get, they get new names, and a lot of these new names are based off of Babylonian gods, uh, and so we're taking that away. They're offered food and wine from the, the, the king's table. This has been food and wine that was sacrificed to idols, to other gods. And then they gave them the study material, right? We're going to train you, and this training material would have been heavy in things like astrology and, and, and stuff like that, which would have been, of course, very, very offensive and just blasphemous to a Jew to be taking part of this. And so that's what's going on. Now in the story, uh, he didn't want to resolve himself to this, so he asked, hey, uh, can you give us water and vegetables instead of all this wine and meat that was sacrificed idols? And the official's like, I don't want you guys looking worse than the other young men, because I'm going to be in trouble then. And they said, well, just try it and then see. So he tries. I think it's like 10 days or so. He gives them the, the water and the vegetables, and they actually look better than the other people. Uh, and so that's what's going on. And then go on, we'll go to verses 17 through 21. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kind. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked to them, and he found none equal to Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first uh, five years of King Cyrus. And again, uh, this is all going on, and the magicians and enchanters, just so you're aware, these aren't like David Copperfield kind of magicians. These are people who are into astrology and black magic and conjuring divination and things like that. Because back then, you know, magicians per se didn't exist just for, like we know magicians, as entertainment. This was kind of uh, uh, engaging in black magic, black arts, um, uh, fortune telling, astrology, all those kind of things that you shouldn't be engaging in just so you're, you're aware of this. Um, but what does this tell us? A couple things. I, I think first it shows that... Um, you can, Daniel can serve this pagan nation uh, that was corrupt and engaging all this idol worship and God worship. He can still serve and be a part of this, but not let it get on inside of him, you see? He did not take part of that. And so it wasn't like he just couldn't be in and among or anything like that. He was in there, he was serving, but... He had some integrity where he's like, you know what? I'm not going to take part in this kind of stuff. Uh, I, what does culture try to do? Culture tries to do essentially the same thing. They try to indoctrinate you and make you look like them, right? That's, that's the same thing. Every song you hear, every advertisement you see uh, is geared to one thing, right? It's trying to give you a message. Uh, and so in this, they were trying to do their best to get them into this training program, to strip them away from their, their um, Jewishness and to strip them away from their identity and get them uh, away from the God they worshipped and all of that. And they tried everything by changing the names and by getting them into the, the, the food worship of gods and giving them this really good study material. But it, they weren't having it. Like they, they still went through it. They excelled in the program. But the difference is they didn't let it get on the inside of them. I think, honestly, if you're going to college this, these days, you kind of got to do this almost, right? If you're going to university, uh, you almost kind of like, okay, I will get and do the requirements that I got to do and write the papers and do the tests and things like that. Um, but I'm not going to let it get on the inside of me, you know, because there is certainly, study after study shows the amount of indoctrination that occurs in colleges and universities today. Um, and, and it's not good. Uh, and, and so this is kind of really a, a good example of that is, okay, we can be part of this and do this, but it's not going to get inside of me. I'm not going to make these compromises. I think I guess what goes back to what we see in the New Testament, you know, um, to, to not be of the world, right? To be in the world, but not be of the world. To not let it get on the inside of you. And so the question is, have, uh, for number one, have you allowed this, right? Have, have you made sure that, okay, I can live in this world, I can live in this culture, and I don't have to be some, like, just antisocial person that I'm like, oh, I can't, be, I can't do that. I can't be a part of that as far as just basic living things. Or 
have you, okay, I can function in society and I can do what I got to do, but at the core, I'm still remaining faithful to God. You know, I'm still going to remain on his truth and I'm not going to allow other culture to indoctrinate me and to make me look like they do. That's what they do. You know, Daniel wasn't going to take on the tone of the pagan nation. He wasn't going to take on all that. He did, what, for the most part, what they wanted, you know, the training program and things like that, and towed the line and was the advisor. But he never stopped being faithful. His core faith was to remaining faithful to God. And just keep that in mind. Same with the, the three friends. And they excelled. It said that they were blessed uh, by doing that. And so if you've ever taken a difficult stand or position or an unpopular position as a matter of integrity, have you done that? And again, there's a balance there because some people are so like defiant and outspoken that you're just off-putting and you're, and you're, not, you're not really helping the case of, of, of um, speaking God's truth and, and being a light. Uh, but at the same time, there's that balance. But just keep that in mind. So... Again, it's a good example. Like, they, they were still part of what they had to do. Part of this pagan regime, um, did the program, but at the core, they were not going to be indoctrinated by this program. They recognize it for what it is. So everyone here, just be aware. Uh, everyone is trying to give you a message, right? Whether, again, every message, every music song, every movie, every commercial is geared to convey a message uh, what, what are you um, doing with that? Are you being aware of it? Are you, or are you allowing it to get on the inside of you? As Christians, we're to look different from the rest of the world. Uh, not off-putting, not you know, self-righteous or anything like that, but just show that we have convictions that we're going to walk and follow and be faithful to God. Uh, chapter 2, we move on. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. And so he has this... Um, very odd dreams. Go to chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. We won't read it, um, but essentially he can't sleep. He has this very troubling dream. He brings all the magicians and the enchanters and all the sorcerers, and he brings them all in, and he says, tell me the dream. Interpret the dream. They're like, oh yeah, no problem. But he's like, wait, this is a catch. He's like, no, no, um, I don't want you just to interpret the dream. I want you to tell me what my dream was. Well, that's, that can be problematic if you're a fraud, you know? I mean, anyone can go in there and give them, like, some kind of palm reader uh, general interpretation uh, and just kind of, like, you know, the, the fraud stuff and just tell them this is what it means and da-da-da. You see a lot of fraud people do this kind of... Um, actually, modern-day magicians have a term that's called cold reading. It's a, te- a technique that professional, like, fortune tellers and things often use called cold reading, where you can give these general things and, and probe information and other techniques that you really can convince people that you have this power, um, but they're frauds and, and they're, they're doing this technique. Uh, but anyways, uh, the problem is, he says, no, no, the king says, tell me what my dream was, and if you don't, I'm going to cut you into pieces, you destroy your houses, your homes, and your family is going to be killed too. Um, and so obviously now there's some panic going on because he, he wants this interpretation and he wants to know them tell him what the dream was. Uh, and they're, what are we going to do? Because they, they can't do that. Well, um, Daniel hears about this, and he's, he gets the guys together and say, okay, guys, you, we better pray. We need to pray because um, we don't want to be killed. I don't want you to be killed. Um, and so we're going to pray right now to see what's going on here. And so now go to Daniel chapter 2, verses 17 through 23. Um, this goes like this. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from God, the God of heaven, concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are His. He changes times and season. He disposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with Him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made me no- made known um, to me, what we have asked of you, you have made known to us the dream of the king. And so that's pretty impressive right away. Uh, so he, he goes, he appeals to God, facing this very, very dire situation. And then God gives him the dream the king had. 
He just downloads that. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. Uh, and so and then go on to verses 36 through 40. He's going to explain to the king what this is all about, because it's a very weird dream about this, this big uh, statue and, and, and things like that. And so he says this, This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind, and the beasts of the field, and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are that head of gold." Head of gold being the, the head of gold he saw statue in this dream the king saw. After you, another kingdom will rise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. And again, this is just part of the... Um, a part of the explanation, if you read the book, he goes into much more detail of, of what was seen in the dream. And uh, essentially, he says, okay, this dream you dreamt is about these four kingdoms, these, the, these four main kingdoms that are going to come. Um, his, and then you have the uh, other, other three to follow that are going to be, play a big, big role in what's going to happen. Uh, and so, and, and very, very detailed, descriptive stuff, Daniel explains to the king exactly what this king has dreamt. Uh, and can, can you imagine that if someone came up to you and told you in detail uh, the dreams that you had? That would be pretty impressive, I think, you know? I mean, uh, imagine you haven't told anybody and, and, you ha and you're, just, you're just going out your day and, and someone comes and tells you this stuff. Um, now, I have had instances where, where um, I've known people who has been, have been given gifts or, or what we call a word of knowledge and they'll be able to tell somebody, something that no one else would have known, and it free, freaks people out. So there are, we see those gifts sometimes uh, mentioned in the Bible. It's called a word of knowledge. Um, and so that still happens to this day. Uh, so it's not like, it, it's not unheard of. I've heard uh, many testimonies of that of people I know and things. So it's kind of a, a wild thing um, to experience, I'm sure. Um, and so then go to verses 46 through 49. Uh, what happens is the king falls down, face down, prostrate, and he, he, he's just amazed. He, he offers all these gifts to him, uh, and then he, he says something very interesting. He says something very, very interesting. And so he goes to, to this, verse 47. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you are able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position, and then as well as his friends. Uh, he, they gave him these, these top positions in the royal court. Uh, and imagine this. I mean, again, um, the Babylonians, they, they valued dreams very much, right? Like, they thought the dream interpreters were something very special, and the, go the gods spoke to them through these, and they had all these interpreters and things like, th like that. Um, but Daniel raises the game that, you know what, I'm not going to play the game of these frauds and the other people that are engaging in this stuff. He tells them specifically, and then now the king is recognizing who the true God is. Chapter 3 now, we see chapter 3 is the image of, of gold and the fiery furnace. You're probably well aware of this. Um, again, we're just trying to touch on these main points to give you uh, some basis for what's going on here in the book. But go to uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. And so uh, this king, who is pretty much an egomaniac, full of pride, has this big, big statue uh, made, like a skyscraper kind of thing. We're going to come, we're going to bow, we're going to worship to this thing. And real quick side note, um, in this culture, these statues, these idols, these gods, all of this were very common. And so it's, it's interesting that uh, that's how God chose to speak to Nebuchadnezzar in these dreams. Uh, he spoke to him in a way that he would understand, right? So when, when Nebuchadnezzar sees these weird dreams of, of these statues and these monuments, uh, I'm sure he, he thinks, oh, another, another god, another monument. What god is this? And so 
God is, again, speaking a language that they would very much understand. It's weird to us, strange to us. What is this all about? But in a culture, in a place that idols were everywhere, these statues were everywhere, this would speak to them and they would get his intrigue going. But keep that in mind. So this is what's going on. This happens. Uh, and now what happens is this. Um, the Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego go to verses, um, is it 13 and 13? We're still in there? Okay, there they are. Well, they, they, won't, they won't bow down and worship to this, this, this idol, this, 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 this big god, this, this big statue rather. Uh, and so the officials go there. They, they pretty much say, you know what? Hey, there's these Jews and they won't, they won't bow down. Uh, and the king is furious. The king is absolutely furious that they will not, they will not do that. Uh, and of course, we know the story. They're thrown into the fiery furnace, right? We all know the story. And so they're bound up. They're thrown in the fiery furnace. We know it's so hot that the, the soldiers that take them there are killed. They're thrown in there. Uh, but something happens. Um, but even more so, I want you to see before we get, we, let's retrace a little bit here because I forgot to mention this, this really um, uh, important response rather. But if you go to, go to uh, we're in 12 through 18, we'll just jump down and let's go to verse 13 uh, when he finds out. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what god will be able to rescue from my hand? Now here's the reply, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. That's a couple of, kind of interesting response. Um, and so he says, listen, we're not going to bend on this. We're not going to worship your gods. And he says, our gods can and will deliver us from your hand. But that phrase, even if he doesn't, that's kind of an interesting phrase. I, I think it kind of stands out to me. Even if he doesn't rescue us from this, um, we're still not going to do it. Uh, there's a lot of ways your mind can go with that, you know, I mean, because you, you think like, okay, yeah, they're definitely sure. They're definitely, he's def God's definitely going to deliver them. Uh, but... That little phrase, like, well, even if he doesn't, we're still not going to do that. And so I, I think we see that very, their very confidence that God's going to rescue them. But even if God doesn't, I mean, they're confident that God can. There's no question in their minds God can rescue them if it's his will to do that. Um, but even if he does not rescue them, they said that we're still not going to bow down and worship your gods. And so he gets furious. He throws them into the blazing furnace. Uh, we'll go to 19 through 30. We won't read it all for time's sake. Uh, he throws them into the blazing furnace. And then jump down. We'll go to verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certain, your, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come out of here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and rescued his servants. They trusted in him, and he defied the king's commands, and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any other god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces, and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way." Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Proverbs of a province of Babylon. I mean, this is a pretty big test of faith. I mean, you probably all heard the story a million times, maybe. 
but again, it's, it's important to read it again just to kind of get a basis and realize just what's going on here in this act. Like this is an ultimate act of faith. You got to wonder too, well, where is, where's Daniel in this? Maybe, maybe Daniel's over there bowing down to the night and he didn't do that. I'm just, no. Uh, where's Daniel though, people often? Well, obviously Daniel would not obviously um, worship this idol either. Most, a lot of scholars think it's very reasonable to think that Daniel was away on some diplomatic mission, part of his job. And maybe that's why he was not part of this fiery furnace story. But they're not going to bow down to this God. And they say, even if it costs his life, we're not going to do this. You know, uh, this kind of brings in direct conflict. They cannot serve the God of Babylon and their God, right? They cannot do that. And so they have to make a hard decision. Who are we going to serve? Think about this. Like, in their minds, idolatry cannot happen. I mean, idolatry is the reason they're in exile to begin with, right? Idolatry is the main thing. And so if we go do, and bow to this God now, what's going to happen? And we can't do that. And so they say, no, we're not going to engage in this, even if it costs them their lives. You know, uh, it's very interesting that in countries and cultures, even to this day, like right now, where Christians are being persecuted and killed and slaughtered, that church seems to be thriving. You know, the church has survived persecution, but it seems like they've even thrived during times of persecution. You look at the church going on in countries around the world, uh, it's, it's amazing to see where it's illegal. You're thrown into jail. You're, you're, you're killed in some countries. Um, but it thrives. People are so hungry for God. They take their faith that seriously. Uh, the question is, do we here take our faith that seriously? That, you know, we're not going to compromise and you're like, well, I don't worship other gods, but we've been through this before in previous chapters. It's not just bowing down to a stone or to a statue, but it's anything you put above God in your life can become an idol. Uh, and so keep that in mind. But they say, no, we're not going to do this. Uh, and then, of course, later Daniel is going to face a very severe test of his faith as well. Um, but this is a book, like, not since the time of Elisha have they seen such miraculous kind of things going on. So also keep in mind, it's not like these miracles and things are happening every day of the week, like, or every second, or, you know, they, these are prominent things, which is why they're recorded here and talked about. And there often seems to be seasons, too, where more of these things maybe happen than others. Uh, but these are, these are prominent things. I mean, because imagine if, if they saw it, like, every single time, every single day, probably like anything, they'd be like, yeah, just, you know, Red Sea parted again, you know, no, whatever. It's just kind of what it is. Uh, but no, this is going on here. Uh, but they commit to this. Uh, and so uh, just quick, what do you learn from the faith of these people? What do you learn from how serious they take their faith? What do you learn from how serious they take that? No, I'm not going to compromise and, and bow down. And again, do we compromise in our own lives? What are we compromising in our faith with God? Whether it's certain sins we don't want to give up, whether it's certain behaviors we don't want to give up, whether it's the way we treat people, whether it's unforgiveness, whether it's probably an even bigger one for a lot of Christians is, is lukewarmness, just being lukewarm about our faith and allowing little things, little compromises here and there. You know, well, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if I listen to that or watch that or do that. Not that big of a deal. Um, God has bigger things on his radar. And again, I'm talking about seeing, being some like, holy to now, holy ruler kind of a person. But I'm talking about no, saying, you know what? I want to have integrity. I want to actually live my life because he, to worship, honor God. And even if I don't think anyone else knows it or sees it, God sees it. God knows it. Uh, and so this is what's going on here that goes on. Now it's even more amazing now that because of this, because of their faith and God delivers them, now Nebuchadnezzar will treat the Jewish religion and move more tolerance. And he, he actually issues that, that edict that we saw. But keep that in mind. Now go on to chapter 4. Another big prominent thing of, of Nebuchadnezzar has another, another dream, this, this kind of strange dream of a tree. Uh, and so in this dream, essentially, this tree is growing, 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 growing real high. Uh, and then this angelic voice yells down, cut down that tree. The, the tree is chopped down to a stump. Um, and uh, what, what is that all about? Kind of a strange, odd dream. And then Daniel is going to interpret the dream. Go to chapter, uh, chapter 4, 3 through 37. We won't read it all for time's sake, but you can go on through there. And... Um, so essentially, he talks about, okay, this dream is regarding you. You're that tree. You're going to be chopped down. 
uh, because of your pride, and you're going to be uh, essentially uh, um, go out, live in the wilderness, eat grass, you're going to lose your sanity. I mean, that's kind of a wild thing. And that happens. And so go to, we'll actually read verse 33. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from his people and ate grass like an ox. His body was drenched with the dew of the heaven until his hair grew like feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. That's kind of um, interesting. Verse 34, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, he's telling this this story here because he he put this out into the kingdom, uh, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored him and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the people of all the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my sanity was restored. My honor and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. And we'll, and we'll stop um, right there and jump down to 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all of his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty powerful statement from the king. I mean, this guy is the powerhouse nation, has conquered all the powerhouse nations, has it all, I mean, like the, the money and the power, I mean, this, I mean, you can't can even fathom. Uh, and though here he says, now he's praising the God of heaven, and he says, because everything he does is right and ways are just, is pride, who walk in pride, he's able to humble. Hmm. So, those who are powerful people, like the people that you know, maybe, who are like, the most powerful people, um, do they recognize a higher power? That's an interesting kind of thing to maybe analyze or think about a little bit. Um, and the question is, what could you do to help them see a higher power? Uh, you know, there's that kind of age-old thing, well, if you're comfortable and you're in high positions of power, well then, you don't look, many may not look for higher power because they, they view themselves as powerful. I mean, many of these kings in ancient times, they deified themselves, to think they were gods. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, when he loses everything, he's driven out, eating grass like an ox, uh, loses his sanity for a period of time. He then calls out to God, and he's restored. Uh, it recognizes who the true God is, and recognizes just, I mean, the Bible is clear. The Bible talks a lot about pride, you know, and the, probably more about pride than a lot of big sins that Christians want to go around and you know, preach against. Now, pride is a big one. Pride and greed are big ones, but a lot of Christians don't want to talk about that because why? Well, because if we're honest, we're probably very prideful. We're probably very greed, greedy, and we don't like that. We want to look at the other things. Well, I'm not that, and so that's the really bad one, but I'm not that. But guess what? One of the things that's the detestable sin, the thing that the Lord hates, is pride, you know? And so pride is something we should be very, very careful about, that we don't get too prideful, that we think we are so big and important and powerful, and also that we don't need God, uh, or that we think that we're you know, um, some super Christian, that, that God owes us something, and that God just is touting over us, or, or whatever it may be. We're to be humble people, right? And says, because right here, it says, God, he recognizes, he says, God is the God who is able to humble. God humbled him. Uh, and that might be a thing that maybe God humbles those who are, you know, pride. The old saying is, right, pride come, come before the fall kind of a thing. But keep that in mind as we move forward in this. And now chapter 5, also a very interesting. This is the writing on the wall. You guys remember hearing this? You probably hear this all the time. It's a saying all the time. You might, I mean, I've, I've heard it used on ESPN before. Right? The writing's on the wall, you know. That's where this phrase comes from. So let me read what's going on here so you can kind of know what's happening. Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. King Belshazzar, uh, or Belshazzar uh, gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar's father had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink for them. So they brought in the gold goblets that he had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze, iron, wood, and stone." 
Suddenly, fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. That's, that's a pretty wild scene. I mean, again, can you imagine if that happened right here? That all of a sudden, like, you just see this hand, and it writes like something over, and there's a message. And now I wouldn't say here because you're like, all right, what's Pastor Tim doing? That's the projector. That's some kind of magic trick he's doing. We're not, I'm not playing that game. But imagine you're laying in your bedroom at night, and, and that happens. All right, now you, now you might think, hmm, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I drank something or ate something that's not agreeing with me. Um, but anyways, so they're all seeing this go on because of the, the terrible uh, things that, that has been going on. Uh, and now again, uh, Nebuchadnezzar at this point has, has died. This is the son. And his, now what's going to happen is uh, the, he's going to want to bring in the people to interpret. Of course, no one can interpret what these words mean or to say. They don't know. The queen then remembers there is this person named Daniel. And Daniel has this gift of interpreting dreams and stuff like that. So they call in Daniel and uh, he says, Daniel, I'm, if you interpret this, I'm going to give you all these, all these gifts and things. And essentially, Daniel says, you know, keep them. I don't, I don't want them, but I will still interpret this for you. And so go to verses 22 through 30. Uh, we won't read all of it for time's sake, uh, but essentially, uh, Daniel says, okay, uh, your father recognized his fall, and then he, you know, he, he re- recognized his problem with pride, but then he picks it off at the very beginning. He said, but you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. And he goes through all the things that Belshazzar has done. Um, and he is guilty of all this. And then the inscription reads this, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. He said, here's what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, uh, you have been weighed on the scales and felt wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, and yet again goes on, all that kind of stuff. And so that happens, though. Two kingdoms, uh, the Medes and the Persians, join forces, and they will overthrow Babylon. Babylon, who is the, the powerhouse of the day. And so that happens. Uh, and now, again, um, more things that are going on. And then chapter 6, we know the famous story, of course, of, of Daniel in, in the lion's den. Uh, and so we won't read the whole thing because there's so much in there. But essentially, the people become uh, jealous of him raising in prominence, right? And so these leaders say, okay, we got to plan something so we can get him out of, out, of, out of the position. And so we'll read the first few verses. Uh, verse 3, Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the state traps by his exceptional qualities that the king's plan to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the state traps tried to find ground for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. And that's where they get him. They essentially talk the king then into setting up this this edict that cannot be revoked, because that's the law. Once the king does this and the seal is put on, they can't revoke it, no matter if the king wants to. That that if anyone's praying in these next days, uh, that they'll be sent into the lions and they'll be killed. And so he does this. But they know that Daniel, three times a day, goes up and faces Jerusalem and prays. And so they go in, they bust them, and they take them to the king, and the king is trying to actually doesn't want to do this. Like he's trying to find a way to, to not have to throw Daniel in the lion's den. Um, but they say, listen, no, you, you have to do this. You, you have already issued the decree. And so the king reluctantly, he does this, throws him into the lion's den, uh, and then we'll pick it up. We'll pick it up here. Um, we'll go to verse um, 19, 19 here. Uh, the king didn't sleep all night. And then it goes this, at the first light of dawn, the king got up, hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue from, yet rescue you from the lions? 
Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted out of the den, no wound was found on him, because he had trusted in the Lord. And then actually we see the people who um, set this all up, they were thrown into the lions then, and they were devoured by the lions. And so we see that. Again, another well-known story of God working a miracle, saving his, his, his people. And then, of course, in 25 through 30, 28, he's going to issue this decree, uh, essentially of, of um, um, the King Darius wrote to all nations and people every language in the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear in reverence the God of Daniel. And then Daniel is promoted as well. And so there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, but again, these are all tentpole stories of the book of Daniel. And this, this, um, these parts are important because, number one, I want us to get in touch base on what's going on. I want you to have some background knowledge for what Daniel's going through, what's the circumstance, what are some things that he's going through. I would strongly recommend actually reading these for yourselves because they are, in my opinion, pretty easy to read and understand for the most part. And then you can really, really, when you read the details, pull out a lot of strong spiritual um, principles and applications. For time's sake, we do not have time to do that today. But I really wanted to set the parameters. Um, we'll end here chat, on this section. I, I know it's um, a little bit a different format for today, kind of, because it is really just knocking out the main tent poles of what's going on. But now I think part two is going to be even more appreciated next week because now we get into some very interesting things in terms of prophecy. You get into some interesting things of Daniel's visions and he, these beasts Daniel sees. What in the world are these beasts Daniel talks about? Um, now, you might see people today read this and s- interpret it this is this nation today, this is this nation today, this is this nation today, and these are the end time stuff. Well, if you want to know what all that means, come back next week because we're going to get into it. I got a whole nice chart for you to see exactly what these symbols mean, what uh, countries they are, um, what are they pointing to. And so if you want to know when Jesus is coming back, come back next week. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I don't know when he's coming back, but you will have a better understanding. I promise you. I, I think you will have a better understanding uh, next week because we're really going to delve into it because when you read this and you have all these imageries and visions and beasts, you're like, what is all of this all about? And so next week, I, I, I encourage you to come back because we're going to talk about this end time stuff and what Daniel was talking about because there's a lot of good things. And also, uh, a lot of things... There are some things, too, that you see in the book of Daniel that will really help you, I think, better understand a lot of things in the New Testament, too, regarding the Son of Man that is mentioned and stuff like that. Um, So come back. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day, God. We come before you this day, God. And and just as we go and read the book of Daniel, God, number one is kind of a reminder. We're just reminding ourselves, educating, uh, learning more about your word. We might have heard some of these stories growing up in uh, Sunday school, um, but maybe forgot exactly what was going on, where they were at, uh, or what they mean for us today in terms of being people of faith and resilience and, and resisting the powers that be and not in allowing other people to strip us away of our identity in you and replace it with their stuff. God, we know we too live in a time and a place that very much wants to indoctrinate us with their worldview, their religion, their beliefs, their morality, their actions and behaviors. And God, help us right now to really spend some time in this in your word and realize that we are to resist that. That we can still live and function in this. I mean, again, uh, your son, Jesus Christ, Father, came and walked the earth and, and dined with sinners and, and came for those and loved those, Father. And we, too, are to do the same, uh, to, to know that we, too, ourselves are sinners, God, and that we can still live in a world, in a government that is dysfunctional, uh, that is a world that is evil, a, a world that is sinful, uh, a world that is broken. We can live in that. We can work in that. 
but we don't have to allow it to get on the inside of us. But God, we have to know that we have to be very careful that we're attentive, that we don't do that. Because every step of the way, again, every message, every show, all the music and movies and even a lot of the books and things and, and stuff people are teaching in schools, Father, there's a message there. Help us to evaluate that message and say, number one, uh, the message is true. Uh, and number two, how does it line up with your word? And God, that we be a people that at the core, we have a, an integrity that we do not compromise, Father, that our main, main goal, our main focus is being a people that are hungry for you, that honor you in every aspect of our lives, and that live out our faith, to please you and honor you, God. Guide us and lead us. Let us learn these lessons from Daniel, Father, their mindset, their faith, their resilience, and also the amazing way in which you work. Even speaking to a pagan king in a way that he would find interest, in a way that would make sense once Daniel interpreted it. And we serve a God who is more powerful than we can even imagine, God. Give us strength, wisdom, and knowledge as we go out of this place to be a people with the faith and resilience of Daniel and his friends. We thank you and praise you in your son. In Jesus' name, amen.